Hello, Julian. Hello, Hello, Mike. What are we going to talk about tonight? Well, I thought we'd talk to a professor of internal medicine about fever and about why veterinary roundings should probably only be two-thirds of length it is. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's Professor Ian Ramsey. You can trust him. Let's get him in, then. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Hope. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Good evening, <laughs> Professor. Ian, hello. Hi there, Julian. Hi, Mike. Hi, yeah. So, we we have no real we have no real structure. You might think after three years we would. It, it's not called ramblings by choice. It really does, doesn't become that way. What we normally like to do is to ask people if they're vets, and then we have vets, we have nurses, we have uh, we had a couple of human orthopedic surgeons, we had yeah. behaviorists, we had non vets, we had a firefighter. And would you have a couple of clowns on for a few weeks time? We like to say, how did you start your career? But it's difficult to know which of your careers. We want to know how you started. So let's go right back to the beginning. And when did you want to be a vet? When did I want to be a vet? I guess right back at the beginning at school, I discovered that I enjoyed and loved biology. It came from a love of biology. It it always did. And I had a very good teacher of biology who made it fun. He said, there's a program coming out tonight, which I want you all to see. That is your homework, is to watch this TV series. And that TV series was Life on Earth. And it was the David Attenborough. Bang. And, and you know, if there was one thing that got me and that idea of evolution and the evolutionary biology and so forth was really interesting and fascinating and from that biology biology became my thing you know that was my thing so i then started when i was 16 17 started thinking about what can i do with biology and of course you know the medicine the vet dentistry all opened up and i've always had cats i always had cats in the household and so forth and it was relatively easy for me to get into a veterinary surgery and I still think vets do it. vets do a very good job of taking on 16-year-olds who are wannabes and letting them at least see what it's like. Because you try and do that in the medical profession. Mm-hmm. Oh, I just want to go along to an orthopedic operation and see what an orthopedic operation would look like. Because I don't know if I want to be a doctor. So half, half the medics, by the time mm-hmm. they turn up at university, actually have never been anything other than the recipient of medical care rather than actually seeing what it's like from the other side as it were the life yeah so, so i went along to the local vet and yeah i was just blown away by it and i thought this is it for me Pri- primary care small animal practice was always and specifically i wanted to do cats at mm-hmm. that time and i arrived at university determined to be a primary care cat vet didn't okay. work out like that but... i was going to say we'll get into the fact that you're the world's leading authority in canine <laughs> hybridrine and cordicism a bit later shall we but uh, <laughs> cats hmm. yeah so did, did you do you think then that you'd stay in academia or return to academia no when i first arrived at university i was going to be a primary care small animal practitioner but during my university course in in liverpool third year we were giving a little bit of free reign, as a lot of courses do. There was a little bit of time in the day to, to fill in with our own private thing, private learning or, or other uh, private activities on Wednesday afternoon or team sports and all the rest. I wasn't, I'm not sporting like that. So I started to look at liver disease and read liver disease papers. And a, a lady by the name of Susan Hayward who's a eminent liver pathologist and uh, a real thinker on, on liver pathology, gave us a seminar on this. And that really fired my interest. And I just started studying. And it never left me that sitting down with research papers, trying to understand better what was going on. And I mean, I always knew it. I mean, like every vet, I have the capacity to study. We all do. But I would sit in the library day after that, getting these papers together. When I was seeing practice, I saw a case of a, what they said was at the time, was a nephroblastoma. Now, that's a really rare embryological tumour of a kidney. And it's a, a disease that's seen in young dogs, and they get 
huge big kidney tumors and i'd never heard of this or been taught about it so i started to uh, we had to do a case report so i started to write a case report on a nephroblastoma and i really went to town on this so i got every reference that had ever been published on a <laughs> nephroblastoma and including one in uh, serbian it was written in the serbian veterinary journal in serbian but it just so happened the dean's secretary was of Serbian background. So I got her to read me the paper and, and <laughs> answer a few questions. And, and that's kind of nerdish type stuff. That, that, that's that's now pretty feeding high up the nerdish shit. Uh, yeah. So rem the, remember, was kids, the, this was before the internet and Google <laughs> yeah, Translate. This was, before the, this was dusty old libraries and, yeah. and doing that. And I duly wrote the case report. And as I finished off the case report, the dog died. And when they went to, and I persuaded the pathologist at Liverpool, Don Kelly, to review the pathology because I said it's nephroblastoma and he was all quite things and he said no sorry it's a carcinoma it's just an, it's just an ordinary <laughs> carcinoma <laughs> <laughs> so that was an early introduction to the frustration and futility of <laughs> academic work if but only on that, that dog had lived for another week <laughs> if that dog had lived. <laughs> but you did win a prize didn't you in 1998 as a young clinician you won the the IAMS award for the best paper published God. by a, a young clinician how did you know that? Did I tell you that? <laughs> we, 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 <laughs> we have we our have sources. Our... We like when we're not when we're not chatting and bantering and <laughs> acting the fool. Do we like to s sit quietly in libraries and read? And <laughs> yeah, you know me. Out? Ian, Ian, I never go out anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So go on then. Ian. So what was this paper? Oh gosh, no. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> that ninety. That that was the that was the paper on. I think that was the paper on TSH. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look. There were three that came out. I published three around that time because I've been qualified quite a while by then. It, it was the thyroid stimulating hormone. It was. It was TSH. It was, right. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll put you out of your misery there. Yeah. yeah gosh. <laughs> that, well, that's quite a long way way forward because I'd gone to Glasgow, did done my PhD, and then went to Cambridge, and I'd used mm -hmm. some of the start. And because TSH had just come out as an assay. I used my research PhD skills to run this TSH assay. So, and there were people at Glasgow, Carmel Mooney and Richard Dixon were doing the research and people at Cambridge, myself and Mike Hertage. And the initial results on the TSH, which Richard and Carmel published were really very good. And uh, my paper showed that it wasn't that good. And, and, and that still stands the test of time. That, that, that paper mm -hmm. still is one that says, they're saying, you know, they've done bigger studies, they've possibly done better studies, but that was the first one that said actually TSH cannot be used in this way. So yeah, I got that. And I, and I got it in, I was given the award in the Vienna Natural History Museum, which wow. was the most stunning setting to get an award like that. What mm -hmm. a place to do it. The only trouble was they asked me to give a speech, but you couldn't speak in it because the huge halls and huge ceilings and all the rest of that, you couldn't hear anything above the racket of other people drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that one. And so did, did that make you think, no, hang it all, I'm going to be a professor? Oh, no, no one actually sets out, so I would never set out to be a professor. I never, it, it just... You just, if you hang around academic, academics, academia long enough, you are, these happens. things, it happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, if, for most people, I mean, some people don't want it. I mean, you know, I took on a lot of administrative stuff. It's not just about your, it can just be about your mm. research, but I did a much more balanced approach to the professorship and I took on significant administrative stuff as well. So, yeah, and that's how that happened. But it was always about, the clinics and the teaching and the research and doing that life that that I enjoy it. Never a boring day, never the same thing every day. Yeah. If I'm bored mm -hmm. with teaching, I'll do a bit of research. If I'm bored with research, I'll do some clinics. If I'm clinics, I'll do go back to the, you, you know, you can always, it's a very variable life. So that's why you took the professorship. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, I, I, I mean, way back when, noticed that there were a lot of 50 year old vets who were fairly bored with their jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were doing th their main job nine, 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 nine in the morning till seven at night, and they weren't fascinated by it. They were doing it; they were very good at it. But what they were doing was, you know, and, you know no one of them who's getting a really good bridge skill, a skill with playing bridge. Another one's good <laughs> at golf. Another one running national associations. So that that kind of thing. 
but the people I, I saw at the universities, Don Kelly and Chris Gaskell and so forth, Dave Bennett, none of them were bored by their job. Then, no, you know, were still absolutely fascinated. And yeah. so that, I mean, I mean, always that was what drove me on. And now I'm sitting here where they were. And I, yeah, it's endlessly fascinating. So why do you think that is? I've got a fairly good idea why that is. But why do you think that is? That the, the, the clinicians in practice will, will, will tend to get bored. Because common things are common. Mm -hmm. And once once you are good with common, you're going to wait for a long time to see the rarity. So all you can do is get more and more good at the common things. And it is the same job. You, you, you know, there, there is a Groundhog Day element to clinical work. And even in referral clinical practice, there's a Groundhog Day. You know, I, I saw a hypothyroid cat today. That is the, for radioactive iodine, that is probably about the 800th radioactive iodine cat I've seen. There, hmm. there is a certain same old about it. So there, there is that. And you just get very good at that. The advantage, And if I had to just do clinics, if I had to just, I would not stay in academia. Right. I would, I would get, it, it's the teaching, it's the research, it's the other bits that you know we're, we're encouraged to do within the universities that makes it interesting just doing clinics well i for a start i'd go and move into a better paid clinical job if that's what i was doing just doing if that's all it was but it's interesting to look at, look at the number of people who are taking part-time jobs and doing something yeah. else yeah. you know i think that's very instructive that that actually you had a but probably about 10 years into your career, you hit a buffer, you realize you're probably about as good as you're ever going to be. And, you know, you just don't have the caseload or the clientele or the re resource or whatever it is to go on and on. And it's not just vets. That applies to almost every career that I suspect you hit a buffer at about 10 years. Mm. And you start then to look for other things to do. And, and that makes the main job that much more fun and interesting because you can bring these other things into it. Do you think that's accelerated post-COVID? No, I don't think... I think COVID made everyone look at their jobs. I mean, anyone who didn't look at their job during COVID was very strange because I don't think there were there was anyone who didn't look at their job, look and think, what am I doing here? And yes, I think there are a lot of people who have subsequent to that taken career changes and we talk about the great resignation i mean in the immediate during covid and so forth there were a lot of people who changed jobs and that wasn't because of covid it was because it directly in the sense they weren't fed up with what they were doing it was more that they actually had thought about why they were doing what they were doing about the future of what they were doing mm, yeah. yeah and i and I, the ripple effect of that is still ongoing and the ripple effect of the effect on veterinary training it is massive. I mean, it's still ongoing. We're still getting young vets coming through two, three years, you know, sort of two years qualified now, who were severely affected by COVID in terms of their training. And that has effect, is still affecting them today. In, in what way? The la lack of confidence. They, I mean, I mean they're, many of them, their yeah. final year was spent watching videos. You know, yeah. now, now, and they just don't have the confidence. And they'll get it. It'll come. Mm. Uh, it, it, you know, it, I, my heart goes out to them. When I when I talk to young graduates, you think, you, you know, I, I, in some respects, the ones who were actually at university probably were in some respects sheltered, but they mm -hmm. absolutely weren't because they weren't getting the experience that they needed. Right. And I think that's that the ripple effect is going to go on for many years. Yeah. I think it will. That there are they call them the, the lost youth, don't they? Of the primary schools, uh, they're the very essence of their beginning to mm. interact socially they're trapped they can't interact socially then they're pushed back into school wearing masks so they have no non-verbal cue recognition or assessment and then they go to senior school where they perhaps are allowed to drift a little bit because the teachers aren't used to teaching children like that they go on to university and propagates doesn't it so I think we're going to see in 10 years' time, we're going to see a whole new set of, of, of new grad vets and obviously all those other professions that have perhaps not got the resources, the, the, the tools mm -hmm. to cope 
in, in, in what is essentially a very, very highly social profession. We communicate. That's the thing. Just as there's the millennials and Gen Z and Gen X, there'll be a Gen COVID. And there'll be a generation, you know, the acid test is, can you remember the COVID pandemic and you were at primary school or secondary school or whatever? And that will mark out just as Gen Z is marked out by a group that can remember certain things or did certain things. There'll, there'll be a generation COVID coming through. I mean, so my, my, I mean, I saw it from the other side as well. My own daughter was doing her undergraduate yeah. degree. You know, first time you, you step out in the world, you're going to meet new people, you're going to go to university, you're going to interact with all these people, you're going to create a social network. In many cases, this will last you for the rest of your life, this social network that you build up at university. And she spent two years at home essentially yep. so as a result she really didn't have the sort of university experience that she had every right to expect um, mm. uh, so i saw it from her side as well and that that's going to have an effect just as the i mean <laughs> you know we predate all three of us predate the internet revolution yes mm -hmm. there, there's the industrial revolution there's the internet revolution there's the social media revolution and we all predate the internet we can all remember a time when there wasn't the internet mm -hmm. you just made that remark about the find it me going out into the dusty hall dusty libraries of Liverpool yes. university i you know now to do a similar search it's five minutes and i can do it here on the computer while we're talking and, but now uh, it takes longer to weed out all the nonsense doesn't it before you were able to go to the clinical abstracts and, oh, and, and the, the reference so? journals do you really think so, Julian? Uh, I think, Julian, you need to, to look here? at... Yeah, I think you need to look at your search criteria. Yeah, and I'm referring to textbook wisdom. There's a lot of stuff written in a lot of textbooks that has got very little to back it up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. We live in a world that's becoming increasingly evidence-based. Yeah. We used to think it was the priority of vets to do evidence-based stuff, but now we have evidence-based teaching on Chair of Governors at local school can do evidence-based governance. Yeah. Uh, are the universities ready, do you think, for, for the gen COVID? Well, I think they, they are in the sense that they're because they were dealing with this issue during, I mean, the first, second, third years were all, you were aware that they were struggling socially and so forth. So I think the universities are fairly quick to adapt, actually to to the passing generations you know the, the days when university lecturers could stand up and drone on for an hour and walk out and take job done those are gone mm -hmm. and there is so much more work put into the teaching and the structure of teaching and to make sure that it's delivering what it says it delivers and how we deliver it so evidence-based communications to students about how they learn changing the way that we deliver material and I mean, one of the things that the vet, all the vets courses have struggled with is that there, there was a time when basically the veterinary information available was exploding and everyone was trying to present the students with as much as possible. And now we're much more, more focused on what do we actually need for the day one competent graduate? You know, right. What do they need early on? So even the veterinary, school, veterinary schools, there's whole chunks of courses that had to be removed and i mean it was like chopping off your right arm it was a painful difficult process for everyone to go through but universities are very sensitive and very quick to change on the basis of student feedback now mm -hmm. right. and sometimes if i was going to be critical i'd say they spent too long getting that instant feedback and not thinking actually for the long-term good yeah, so they um, chop and change too much and go yeah. oscillate. I mean, I saw this firsthand under your direction when we were doing the first virtual BSAVA Congress. And it was quite a revelation for me because I'm not sure if you know this, Mike, but Ian was president of BSAVA yeah. during COVID. And I was called in to, to help out in a tiny way so to organise the BSAVA Congress, the annual mm -hmm. world-leading BSAVA Congress, which we'd never done virtually. We didn't have the faintest idea. And Ian said, well, clearly, what we must do is limit the lectures to 20 minutes plus questions. We all thought, well, oh, no, 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 lectures are 55 minutes, because then you've got a, a five-minute break and you can get to the next lecture theatre. He said, well, you don't need to get to the next lecture theatre, you're already there. So they're 20 minutes, 
we have questions, and then we what? Oh, and, but there was evidence for that, wasn't there? If you're trying to learn something, you can sit and listen to a human being in the room for 40, 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. But how much do you actually take away? And the answer is not very much. So anyone can do it, but we don't actually take very much. We know that most of the learning is concentrated in the first 10 minutes and the last two. And so if you're going to get your message over, that's where it's got to come. And when you look at people learning online, it's much shorter. I mean, people cannot listen to 40 minutes. I mean, just think how good a film has to be for you to watch a film all the way through, to maintain concentration in a film in your own house. It's different when you're in a cinema. Mm. Yep. because there's nothing else but in your own house watching a film and how good it's got to be to have you absolutely rooted for that film and not want to stop it and the problem is that when you're delivering cpd you're saying hey you know you know you get somebody like me up I'm, I, I ain't no robert de niro you know there's no way i'm going to hold an audience's attention for 40 minutes in that kind of room and there's no pause and if it's live you, you know what people want to be able to do is to to pause things. So so this sort of format here where we're recording something, uh, then we play it back and people can pause it, go away, make themselves a coffee, come back. And you'll find that, that it's more digestible in that format. But if you're doing it live, then you must keep it short. It's short and sweet. I'm sure yeah. none of our listeners would pause us in between. I and, hope and they will. Sure. No, I tell to, to the <laughs> listeners, pause, go get a coffee, think about it, come back because you'll learn more. Is there any particular research that you're referring to there that tells us that? Because perhaps we should change the format of veterinary ramblings. There is research. There is research. I can't cite your papers. I'm not, I'm, I get this from people who are educational experts in the same way as yes. I teach them endocrinology. I, I learn how to teach from those people. So I know that people need to take a break when they're learning surprisingly more frequently, surprisingly shorter chunks are better than a big chunk it's is human attention span shortening no we're just learning how short it is right so we're waking up to the fact that yeah. it's a short attention span look at gen z look at them on mm-hmm. minecraft look at them on minecraft don't tell me their attention span is short they're absolutely focused on what they're doing for minecraft or whatever it is you can people can still focus very hard for a very long period of time if it's sufficiently interesting what we're actually admitting to ourselves is that we're not sufficiently interesting (laughs) so so it's a lie to say that all the all the kids of today can only speak in staccato sentences and they they can't hold long conversations because they're so used to watching tiktok which is that well (laughs) i don't know what you get up to on the internet mate (laughs) that's up to you i I, I wouldn't know about tiktok so i of course they can hold long conversations yeah Mm, yeah it just occurred to me that you said a moment ago we should say to to listeners or viewers go off and have a coffee and i thought we could we could do something like this so okay viewers we're gonna have a break now have a coffee break okay you won't miss anything and now they go off um, coffee break and they think they paused it and then they switched on again like, <laughs> that's brilliant that's the funniest <laughs> thing i've ever heard it's a shame people miss that if they're not for a coffee break isn't it? <laughs> never get that back <laughs> that's so cruel so we can move on that's so on. cruel i want to do something different if i may mm-hmm. tonight guys if we're, we're talking about short attention spans we're talking about packing the information in that first 20 minutes and making it engaging and that's sort of what we do on Veterinary Ramblings for our listeners and our viewers with 60 Second CPD. Mm. So yes. I'm going to do something different tonight. Uh, Ian, have you, you've come across 60 Second CPD, have you? Yes, I saw a couple of people doing it. Okay. Are you up for the challenge? We wouldn't normally do it at this stage of the evening, but I thought I'm going to throw it in the middle, as so that's what we're talking about. Fine. So you're up for the challenge? Yeah. Okay. So what's your subject going to be on? <laughs> my, my specialist. <laughs> I thought we might discuss fever is good. The concept of fever is good. Fever is good. Fever mm-hmm. is good. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, then, Professor Ian Ramsey, the subject fever is good. 60 seconds starting now. Okay. Fever is good. Birds do it. Every endothermic vertebrate does it. Ectothermic vertebrates do it. Bees do it. 
they've been doing it since the Devonian period, 360 million years ago. Why have we preserved that thing in evolution if it's not good? Fever makes your white blood cells work harder. It makes your acute face proteins work better. It keeps your the viral excretion down. It shortens disease. It makes it better quicker. So let the animals have a fever. We've always treated fever, but we've never shown that the treatment of fever actually provides any long-lasting benefits. We should try and let an animal have its fever because it will get better quicker. Fever is good. But we've got time for questions. Wow. Oh, I have several. Um, oh, and the, you're out that, of time, that, Julian. Bad luck. Oh, That's fantastic. Oh. <laughs> that was excellent. That was really good. And what a subject. Tell so us more. The way, by the way, that you managed to get not only Peggy Lee's Fever song into it, but yeah. also the Irving Berlin, wasn't it? Bees do it. Do it. Bees do it. Do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so so you know where the fever is good comes from. Yes. Yeah. That's that, that's Wall Street. The, oh, no, uh, I didn't. Ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 I did. I no, fever is good. Is uh, Michael Douglas's speech on Wall Street? Greed is good. Yeah. Uh, greed is good for the capitalist economy. Weeds out the uh, the poor companies and mm. drives forward enterprise, and it drives forward uh, engineering. And I listen to that, and I don't agree with any of that. So like, that 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 stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> greed is good becomes fever is good and it really is it's a fascinating subject is fever when you start to look at and that's a classic example of where evidence base just does not support an awful lot of what we do in practice so because we more. drive that temperature down as quickly as we can yeah yeah. yeah body does it for itself anyway you can't mm. get you know f- 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 fever the temperature will go up but then it'll flatline whereas hyperthermia and i should also, that one thing is that hyperthermia is bad. It's I was bad. going to say, can we clarify this? Because we've got a number of non-medic listeners here. So mm-hmm. you're talking here about pyrexia. Yes. Which is, correct me if I'm wrong, one or two degrees above normal, as opposed to... Tell us more about it, Ian. So, so, so hyperthermia is where you just cook. So dogs left in hot cars, they're normal animals, and their temperature will just go up as high yeah. as and higher and higher. And eventually all their cells start dying and they die because their rate of heat going in is greater than the rate that they can lose heat by right. panting or whatever. Yep. Pyrexia is where you alter your set in your room. There's a thermostat. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's set point like that. OK, that's your temperature of the room. That's your thermostat. OK, yep. fever, your thermostat goes up. So first thing is you feel cold. You right. shiver and shake and ooh. ooh, ooh. And then that gradually raises the temperature up there. And then you feel okay for a while. Mm -hmm. But the problem with fever is that set point keeps changing. So now you're sweaty. Now you're shivering. Now you're sweaty. Now you're shivering. And your temperature hasn't stayed in it. It hasn't necessarily changed very much. But it's because the thing, so the symptoms of fever are not temperature dependent, but how much your thermostat is going up and down. How far away your set point is now compared to what your actual temperature is. So if it's here, it's just as bad as if it's here, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because it's Mm -hmm. actually the distance is immaterial. So yes, there there is a limit on fever. And that is that with the stress and all the rest of fever, you get an increase in cortisol, which acts as a natural anti-fever drug. So on its own, fever rarely rises much more than about well you say two yeah. i would say two degrees centigrade okay something like that so but just be careful because obviously there there is fahrenheit as well so so 39.5 41 it is about the top of fever now the problem is that fever and hypothermia can coexist right mm-hmm. so if you get a a fever in an animal it's that much more likely to become hypothermic and, and cook so a sick dog in a hot car is in a very dangerous place mm-hmm. indeed so so that that's that's really why things happen the, the way they do. And there's this misconception that just because the f- temperature is 40, you've got to bring it down, which actually isn't going to help. The, you, the fever is there for a purpose. We've evolved it. Bees, I remember the bees do it. If you get a fungus in a beehive, okay, all the little bees go together, like, flap their wings and flap their wings and then generate higher temperatures in the hive 
and it drives the fungus away. If you're yeah. really mean to the bees and you put a cooling coil in the hive, even though they're trying to make the temperature, it doesn't work because your mm. cooling coil's in there and all the bees die of the fungus. Yep. Yeah. And, and and they will do this because they're a, a hive mentality, a collective, that they will do this heating to the extent that the ones on the outside who have to work harder will die off. But the majority of the hive will survive, that they'll outlast the or outlive the fungal mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, that a few of them will die. That they'll exercise themselves in terms of negative energy. Yeah, yeah, death, yeah. negative energy yeah. balance, and then die. But um, the rest and, of the hive will survive. Doctors, doctors, and, and by instrument vets have always treated fever mm. because it made the patient feel better. Yes. And if you want to get paid, it's a good idea if you make your patient feel better. Makes okay? sense. But no one has ever shown that helps long-term survival. But it doesn't matter because the doctor gets paid anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what should we do, ideally? Not treat pyrexia? Uh, but uh, monitor. Yeah. Yeah, 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 essentially monitor until the fever itself becomes so debilitating. So, for example, if the fever is making an, you or an animal completely anorexic and has done so for four or five days. Now, at this point, the fever is becoming counterproductive. So mm -hmm. at that point, you intervene. So one of the things I think is very important is that vets agree amongst each other when we're going to intervene. And that's one of the interesting things. So when I do a lot, a lot of lecturing, touring around the globe, giving lectures, and I have interactive presentations, and mm -hmm. I can split a veterinary audience 50-50 every time by asking them, will you treat this fever? You just put a case and for half the vets say yes and half the vets say no or, you know, 70, 30 or something like that. And we've no agreement amongst ourselves on how to manage even the most basic thing of an animal turning up with a fever. And that really has been, you know, it's, it's sort of never mind all the fancy stuff, all the zebras and all the rest. That surely is the more important thing for it's internal basic, medicine specialists it? yeah. to, to yeah. actually get down to the really basic thing of do you treat a fever? And if so, with what? And don't let's get started on the non-steroidals, antipyretic steroids and so forth. But it's a really important question that we don't, and I think academics should engage in this kind of discussion and debate and teaching to try to firm up, not so much that necessarily we not always know the right answer, but rather at least provide a consistent answer. You know, when, when as an animal owner, if you go to uh, go take your sick animal, it matters so much who the vet is they some one vet will treat this one vet won't and i've just given an example of pyrexia but there's plenty of others one vet will do an investigation one vet won't when's it right to do a routine blood test yeah and we don't agree we don't discuss these things we don't like being challenged and we don't like thinking it through and i think it's really important that the veterinary profession does do that because that's it i mean i'm sure you've all seen the mystery shopper things when people like which have gone into vet surgeries and they've given uh, you know a scenario and they've walked out with either a bill for a thousand pounds or a bill for 200 and they're saying the veterinary profession is robbing us and the reality is no nobody's robbing anyone it's just we, we haven't decided amongst ourselves what we should do yes. even in a case yeah. of a basic fever we have not decided whether we should intervene or not now this is a time in, in the world's history i say history because by the time people are listening to this, it's history. This is a time of the world's history where we need to be paying much more attention to things like this, because if we can help the body to get over infections, then we need to rely less on antimicrobials. Certainly uh, is. Do you want to tell us what, do, do, do you want to pass on a rumour to us, if I could make it <laughs> oh. So <laughs> antimicrobial resistance is a worldwide problem. It, it is there are certain bugs in the UK which are very resistant to many commonly used antibiotics. In other parts of the world, the resistance problems are really severe, uh, and in other parts, not so bad. There are no new antibiotics. There never will be. You know, we've got all the antibiotics we're ever reasonably going to have. Therefore, if they are going to continue to be useful, we have to use them in a in an appropriate way and we know that doctors and vets will prescribe antibiotics at on occasions inappropriately and the result 
is as ultimately an increase in antimicrobial resistance, mm-hmm. which defeats the whole point of the antibiotics. Now, in some sections of the veterinary world, in the large animal, farm animals, so forth, this has been tackled very successfully in the UK by RUMA, the Responsible Use of Medicines Alliance, R-U-M-A. And they've done a fantastic job at reducing antimicrobial usage on farms. And this was a conglomerate that got together, not just of the vets, but also of the farming organizations. So National Farmers right. Union and Poultry Fancies Associations and all the rest, they all came together to tackle this as an industry-wide thing. And they've done a really good job. And really, it, the focus is now shifting onto small animals mm-hmm. and to start asking, how much can we do to reduce the levels of antimicrobial resistance and targeting that, therefore, is really about the inappropriate use of antimicrobials. And so an organization called the Responsible Use of Medicines Alliance, in brackets, Companion Animal and Equine, has been set up to act as a, as a hub around which organizations such as the BSAVA, the BVA, the the big corporate partners and so forth can all come together to try to reduce antimicrobial resistance in small animals in the UK. We released our first report and these reports are significant in that they they monitor how we are doing. And it's an annual report and the RUMA have been producing their annual report now for a number of years. We produced the first companion animal and equine report last November. There's another one coming up this year and we will pr- chart how we are doing on this. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the way we are going to achieve this is by all these organizations doing their own th- thing and coordinating with it. So mm-hmm. our CVS Knowledge has a great website and they do an awful lot of work with this. And I'd encourage people to go to our CVS Knowledge, go to the BSAVA's Protect Me, which is their scheme for choosing the right antibiotics when you need an antibiotic and mm-hmm. also identifying when you don't need antibiotics. And recently, we've also started this idea of an antibiotic amnesty. Uh, rather like one of these knife amnesties it's to get back all those antibiotics which is there's absolutely huge numbers of antibiotics sitting in people's cupboards Mm -hmm. under their sinks and so forth which ultimately unless somebody gets them back into to the veterinary practice are likely to be disposed of through the household waste or flushed down the toilet both routes are inappropriate and lead to antimicrobial resistance in the environment that We're seeing that already, aren't we? Uh, With surfers, for example. That's right. So uh, we know that surfers in UK waters, (laughs) and uh, there's a political thing about that, of course, but surfers in UK waters have a three times higher rate, sorry, 30% higher rate of carriage of antimicrobial resistance organisms than control members of the population who do not surf. Uh, And that's because the sewage being pumped into our coastal waters is giving them these bugs and we know that every inhabited continent has antimicrobials in their rivers you can find them in every everywhere and there are there are rivers in brazil where quite literally a pint of water is equivalent to a tablet of antibiotic bloody wow wow gosh that that's and the statistics sound frightening because they are frightening aren't they well, what was the statistics? We did a we did an appeal for the Bella Moss Foundation mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago, which I'm sure, as we're talking about this, you're familiar with oh, sure. the, the educational work that they're trying to do as well, mm-hmm. which is obviously the same as you. And what was the figure that we got from the Telegraph? It's like 10 million? 20, 20 million unnecessary deaths over the next five to ten years due to antimicrobial resistance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I saw, well, I saw a similar statistic today on those figures which is one death every three seconds, yeah. Yeah. which is just, is just mind-blowing, isn't it? It is. Isn't well, it? And, and Ian's absolutely right. We, we won't see any brand-new antibiotic come out. We'll yeah. see bacteriophages or viral infections, perhaps. We may see even gene therapy for the antimicrobial infection. But ultimately, what we really need to do is to get back to basics and not rely on drugs to, to clear yeah infections yes yes so, so so there's a number of topical dressings silver impregnated stuff manuka honey and so forth which are bactericidal 
because they're chemically so and bacteria can't become resistant to what is essentially chemistry rather than biochemistry. I think it's important to emphasize this is not about telling people not to use antibiotics for bacterial infections. It's trying to stop people using bacterial antibacterials when they don't know that there's a bacteria, they don't even know that. So I, I think it's the figure is something like when actually admitted, 20% of doctors will admit that when they don't know what's wrong with the patient, they will prescribe antibiotics. They yes. don't know, so they try antibiotics anyway. And that's that's so it's much more about that side of things than saying, no, you must use antibiotics even when there's infections. It's actually making sure that, and when you do use it in the face of infection, using it properly. So mm -hmm. that means a high dose for long enough. Now, how long is long enough is a big research question. And we still don't know that, but at least till clinical cure would seem to be reasonable. But, and a high dose. And one thing I really don't like is we talk about the tonnage of antibiotics used that the danger of that is the metric, then everyone just reduces the number of milligrams they give to a dog, then they reduce their antibiotic, and that actually will make the matters worse. So it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. You, you that, go suddenly for close to the bacteria more yeah. survive than the greater potential for resistance. So, so for me, it's the number of prescriptions. Okay. Not once, once you start, it's the a prescription incidence. Mm. It's every time that selection pressure is applied is, is every time there's a prescription. So it's important that prescription is the number of yeah. prescriptions is kept down, but when they're given properly and, you know, uh, compliance, oh, you know, compliance is yeah. horrible. I mean, uh, so there's great little studies where you get a pot of tablets and every time you want a tablet, you have to press the lid. And out pops the tablet. Mm -hmm. And they give this to, to, to humans. And of course, inside that lid, that little press down lid, there's a wee chip that records date and time, number of presses and so forth. And when you have one tablet, if you have to take the one tablet, say twice a day, first three days, mm -hmm. all's well. Third day, fourth yep. day, nothing gets pressed in the morning. What mm -hmm. do you think happens in the evening? Two it's presses. Two. Two presses. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it doesn't take long. The figures are something like 95% of us can complete four days twice a day. Yeah. Beyond that, it starts to fall down. And if you look at yeah. a human being trying to take four different medications for more than one week, the compliance rate of actually sticking to those four goes down to less than 50%. Got, and we're all we're all prescribing away. Yep, yep, we give names. How can vets help with this with rumor? So, so rumor is a coordinating rumor is a coordinating hub. It's not something that people necessarily come along to help. Mm -hmm. it, it is more about when your corporate or your veterinary association or something comes up with an idea is participating in that. So, for example, many of the corporates got involved in the most recent antibiotic amnesty. We'll be running that again in November. So when they get watch out for and wait for when that information comes out and then start having conversations with your um, clients. And probably the single most important thing that vets can do is to recognize the problem and then to start talking to clients about it. And once you break through that barrier of having a conversation with a client about no antibiotics today, then that, that goes a long way. Have conversations in your practice policy. You know, people, oh, policies, but actually we just say an agreement that we're all going to agree that for the next few months or whatever, if we see a dog with a urinary tract infection, that we're all going to use the one antibiotic. Whatever one you choose, mm -hmm. it actually matters less than the fact that you all choose that antibiotic. And nobody starts wandering off doing their own thing. That is more about, that's going to do more for antimicrobial, reducing antimicrobial resistance than anything else, is to have an agreement. That's what the Protect Me poster is about. Yeah. And many people have a Protect Me poster in their practice. Not many have actually filled it in. Actually go through and decide amongst yourselves, we're going to use whatever amoxiclav for this infection. We're going to try to use something relatively narrow spectrum where we can. So rather than using amoxiclav, we might actually decide that we're going to use amoxicillin. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, not amoxicline, but amoxicillin. Already you are helping yourself by going down there, down that way, because amoxicillin will work in urinary tract infections 99.99% as well as amoxiclab. So why aren't we using amoxicillin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, so I don't think, th I think rumor is more about a coordination. It's more mm -hmm. about the report writing and it's about the assessment of where we are and where we want to be rather than something you come along and join and support. This is I, I, bigger. I broaden the question and say, how can we, so our listeners aren't vets, most of them aren't in the veterinary mm -hmm. world at all. How do we convince those people that a trip to the doctors shouldn't end with an antibiotic necessarily. A trip to the vets shouldn't end with an antibiotic necessarily because the pressure that's put on from doctors on a Friday afternoon for antibiotics is huge. The pressure that's put on vets. Well, Miss, Mr. Jones always gave me antibiotics for this. Mm -hmm. You're a new grad, aren't you? Well, I want to see Mr. Jones. He always gave me antibiotics for this. You see, I'll take a different view on that. I'm not sure that. Yeah. I think that pressure's much more internal. I think the pressure comes from within us, except there are some clients out there who can be a bit like that, but they are in the vanishingly small minority who actually are sufficiently well-educated, sufficiently knowledgeable to start that argument up with a vet. Really requires some presence of mind and some knowledge because you should be able to argue a way, a way around it. I mean, it, you know, if the dog's got a an acute cough, it is most likely to be viral. And and once you you know, what's the point of giving antibiotics? And particularly yeah. in the veterinary yeah. world, when you're charging for those antibiotics, you say, I'm going to save you money. <laughs> you know, in in a very simple phrase like that, I think in many ways the veterinary world's quite going to have has an advantage over some of our human counterparts in that it is going to cost money to go down this route if you go down antibiotics and it might be a complete waste of time whereas in in human medicine it that money element is perhaps not such an immediate turnoff so i mean when early on when i was doing a, my phd i did quite a bit of locuming to support myself and i always remember i went to this one practice where i was told the the fees were and it dates me a bit this seven pounds for the consultation and five pounds for the first injection. And I, I was there consulting all morning mm -hmm. and she came and the owner came through to me and she said, you're not charging. And I said, yeah, I'm charging seven pounds for the consultation. He said, but you're not giving them the injection. And yeah. I said, don't yeah. need it. They don't need the injection. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh no, the whole model only works if you give them an injection. Yeah, I got told off my, uh, my second job because I wasn't even on. And do, basically, you need to inject, do, do, do. inject, yeah, inject every animal yeah. with antibiotics to start them off. And I thought, what absolutely, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And one of the other thing I also worked out was why all the dogs in that practice look really nervous. I've never I seen so many out. dogs walk in and already the lip was curling and they knew what was going to come and come their way. They were all, I, I just, yeah, you know, and that. That's the sort of thing that we need to work on. I mean, that was many years ago. Many years. Ago. Other than intravenous antibiotics, we, we, we don't have any injections well as well as the practice these days. Never. You don't take you we don't have intravenous. Have, we have intravenous, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Other than that, it suddenly occurred to me. We know that most kennel coughs is caused by a virus. And yet we know that antibiotics are given in I forget the statistics, but you know, a fair number of cases of kennel coughs. Can we be accused of, uh, of fraud? No. Two reasons okay. for that. No, for, first, it, it depends on your locality. You say most kennel coughs are viral. No, Bordetella bronchoseptica is a primary pathogen mm. of the dog and can primarily cause kennel cough. And in your particular area, Bordetella may be way more common than the viral causes. When you look at surveys in different countries and in different times they where they've had outbreaks, then they the variety of agents involved is huge. What I think we need to do is to perhaps start saying, hey, make sure we do a throat swab. Bordetella is dead easy. To, so what you should be doing is saying, let's get a throat swab out of this animal. And if it's Bordetella, then if the animal is not better, yeah. we know what we're doing. We've got the sensitivity profile. We know what we're doing. And then we can treat that. So I think that would be a, a mm. better way of approaching it rather than saying it, it's all viral because in kennel cough, it, it may not be. So I would encourage vets to make sure that they start thinking like that and then using the antibiotics sure. when you isolate a bordetella and it hasn't gone away by itself, 
then you can intervene. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, what would be really good is if we, that throat swab would also be good for viruses. You know, it, it, I mean, the concept of throbbing, swabbing a throat and diagnosing a virus is really taking a big jump forward with COVID because before <laughs> before COVID, no, you know, vets just didn't think no. like that. Now, no, I try and, yeah. I, oh, switching to cats, I've always tried to persuade people to diagnose the cause of cat flu. Mm -hmm. There's only two, yeah. there's only, if that's all nearly always viral, 99% of them are viral. There's only two. It's dead easy. You do a throat swab and it has such importance to the cats in later life that it's really important to do that. But uh, you know, and, and I always felt I, it was really hard to make people do it to understand why we were doing it and to be able to do it properly. The modern vet, now, modern young vets coming through, I just say, do a throat swab. And they just, well, yeah, of course, because they've been doing it. Yep. All the time. So, so there are some benefits of the COVID. Yeah, there <laughs> are, and, and, and they're much better at doing ear swabs as well. Hmm. And finding out yeah. what's going on in the ears. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So I know I don't think you can be accused of fraud. I think that's too strong. But mm -hmm. I think. De de depending on whether you can self-accuse yes well you can accuse yourself yeah, you're, the wrong you're still beating yourself up there yeah, yeah. incompetence yeah. possibly but fraud is a bit too strong yeah <laughs> <laughs> you like fixing things don't you ian i have a yes i like i enjoy diy Oh, I'm, I'm not sure my, the whole veterinary industry and, and oh, uh, I see, oh, I see, fixing things. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, yes, I think I've been lucky enough to be in a fairly privileged position within the industry, in that I have. Yes, I've got my clinical work, but I have time as well to think about these things and do things. I, you know, you know. I'm not claiming that I've seen more kennel cough than Julian. I'm absolutely sure he's seen more kennel cough than me, but I've had the time to do the research time to look at it time to to get that information so that that though those few cases of kennel cough that i do get and i do actually or believe it or not we do get sent kennel cough we get animals of kennel cough i've got more and i teach it and you know do one see one teach one it's if you've got to teach final year students year after year you get to know your stuff really well and yeah. that that's where i think university academics particularly those of us who have a big clinical component and can't do the kind of research i mean i can't run a lab on the side and all the rest doing that. I haven't got the capacity in to do that, but I can make a difference in the profession. And, and that's really a strong thing in my life. Is it going to change the profession? Am I going to actually be able to do something? I'm not interested in doing research on an interventional radiology that that is is useful for one case in 10,000 it's not as and it's great stuff that they do and it's marvelous and it's wonderful to see all this stuff but i'm no personal interest in developing like that i want to do things that make a difference in practice pretty much and you've done that and you've certainly done that and to mention the paper you won the iams award for the best paper you in 2015 won the bsava woodrow award for contribution mm -hmm. to small animal medicine which you know, a much coveted award. And I wonder if people listen to this now can tie that, that tremendous meritorious award in with perhaps something as mundane as fixing a system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the same sort of thing. It's broken, <laughs> let's fix it. <laughs> whether whether it's and, and an element of service, I think is also very important. I mean, I mean, uh, service to the profession. We are very fortunate vets to have been born with, you know, grey matter between our ears, which is of a higher order than average. Okay, put another way. There's a lot of smart people in the veteran profession, and we should be putting that that to service to good. Yeah, and, because and giving it back to some extent. Yeah, and I, I wasn't wanting to belittle your award at all. Uh, like not at the, all. You, you have. I'm not one of those people who keeps an award in the in in the toilet. I, I mean, you hear people no. do that. I think that's ah. an awful well, well, thing. Well, 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 now you've mentioned that. Way. Hang on, Julian. Wait a second. Now you've mentioned that. I think we've got an award for you, and all of our listeners, because you've delivered a, a fair old tome this evening on a number of topics and a fabulous 60-second CPD. Julian, have you got our CPD certificate, which we could call no, an I award have. for Ian? I mean, it's, uh, I have. Here we go. It's a. Uh, Certificate of being responsible for many things. Oh, right. 
<laughs> a few of which we've touched on. So there's the there's the toilet there. That you can <laughs> now you mentioned cycling. There, there's someone cycling, me cycling, yeah. a flat cap on. We haven't got into your hill walking and mountaineering, which you like me share a love of. <laughs> we haven't covered any of and, and we also haven't covered your love of classical music. Now, the best <laughs> of here of a, of a, of a, yeah, a, a telecaster. I mean, it is classic rock music, isn't it? You like Is that the classic music? Have I got yeah. that wrong? No, it's status right. quo. It must be. Yeah. It's probably stuff like status quo. And... That's... <laughs> it, all, all of those chords. All four of them are fantastic. They go so well together. I suspect, Julian, that it's not status quo. <laughs> I don't think it can ever be. No, I just quo. saw a flicker. I saw a flicker <laughs> there where we mentioned status quo, and like, I think it might be more visceral, like visceral, visceral, recoil. Oh, visceral <laughs> yeah. recoil. Visceral recoil. I told you about because so Queen and status quo. I mean, Queen were essentially, you know, you listen to it, and it, it is operatic mm, yeah. there's a lot of status quo that is operatic in, yeah. in things there's an amazing amount of recycling of classical music into pop yeah and, and the other way around if you're andrew Lloyd Webber, <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a classic because it survives yeah 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 i, I think what, what this certificate shows more than anything is we've barely scratched the surface of, absolutely uh, of, of professor ian ramsey and i think it would be Difficult to do that if we had a four or five hour session. We know that anything beyond 20 minutes is a waste. Now. <laughs> Which is what, I'm quite happy to chat because, you know, well, let's face it, your that. audience has already gone, Julian. <laughs> they probably have, actually. Yeah. <laughs> we get that a lot. <laughs> so, sometimes they're kind enough to let us know that they've gone. Yeah. Other times they just wander off and we're left chatting to the ether. If, if you're going to challenge the profession and Give us a reflection question. Have you got a question that we could reflect on that summarises some of what we've spoken about this evening, perhaps? Uh, yes, I, and, and I think it's a fairly broad topic, but why do we not follow guidelines? There's so many guidelines out there about this, that and the other. Many people even know what the guidelines are, but why do we not follow them in our practices? Why do we not follow Protect Me or an antibiotic or another antibiotic mm -hmm. thing? Why do we not have a fever protocol in the practice that we could also? I mean, half the battle is not getting someone to write a fever protocol, but getting everyone to follow it. Why do we not follow protocol? And and that's a, a question I reflect on because there are protocols in the University of Glasgow that I do not follow. Yeah, and I always reflect on. on and think about why it is that I don't do that, because I think that is quite is probably the most important thing in terms of clinical medicine that we could all look at. And sometimes it's because the protocols are rubbish. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's because they're unfollowable. You can't do it. Do it. There, was, there was a famous one involving MRSA, where they basically had the protocol of isolating every patient with MRSA, and did it did nothing for the spread. The MRSA spread even further and faster. And it quickly, you know, they started to look why it was. And the fact is that by isolating, they didn't increase the number of nurses in the hospital. So as a result, these nurses were running from isolation unit to isolation, whereas they used to just go down the ward. Now they were going from isolation unit to isolation unit to isolation unit. And it was much, much harder for them. And they were getting faster and faster. And they were couldn't keep so the they couldn't, they couldn't performing hygiene they yeah. were skipping hygiene steps in between so yeah. yeah you know that's the kind of so some protocols are wrong and they're unfollowable some protocols are, are just bad but you know even when you've got a good protocol it's hmm. difficult it's difficult to get people to follow it and i think why we don't why we're not better at doing that knowing that it will ultimately lead to improved patient care why can't we follow them? And that's a very human yeah. question. Mm. So that's the mm. human condition, it, isn't it? Mm. it? It is. And you alluded to a few possible answers earlier, didn't you? To, people didn't like to be questioned. We have our knowledge, we're comfortable with our knowledge, we have that experience rationalising that knowledge. We don't want that to be shaken. We don't want the edifice upon which we built our experiential mm. knowledge to, to, to be shaken. Yeah. We don't want to get out of our comfort zone, in short. Yeah. We've always given this, it's always worked, therefore it must be because we've given it that it's always worked. Yes. 
Dr. Johnson, Samuel, physicians are chief amongst men in mistaking subsequence for consequence, i.e. doctors give a patient a drug, the patient gets better, the doctor assumes it was their drug that made the patient better. Or if the patient gets worse, then it's a bad drug. Yeah. yeah. Either, either way, but the assumption that subsequent is the same as consequence. There's Sounds a tribe awful. in New Guinea whose diet is very rich in, in papaya, which contains a trypsin inhibitor. They eat very little meat throughout the year, but every year they have a festival called Pig Bell, where they, you know, they kill a few pigs, put them in a big pit, cook them up and share them out. And this appeases one of the gods that they revere. Because they've lived on a diet that inhibits trypsin and they can't digest meat very well, they all become very ill the next day. And it goes through cycles because they then think, well, clearly we didn't eat enough pigs to appease the gods. So the next year they cook even more and become even more ill. And this goes on for so many seasons until their breeding stock diminishes so much that they go a year or two without having the proper big bill and they're all okay and then they do it all again well we're no better are we Given uh, uh, well to routine diarrhea cases yeah yeah it's, uh, it's there's an element of defensive medicine there as well which we have to yeah. explore and there is a lot of what I call semi-defensive medicine going on. I, people think they're being defensive, but actually they're not defending themselves. In fact, it may be making it worse for themselves. But there's a there is a, an element, and the fear of being you know I don't know I don't think I know anyone who's been sued for negligence in the veterinary world. I'm trying to think. I mean, I've gone through seen various things in my career, but and yet I hear people, I hear senior vets tell junior vets you could be sued for that. I just no, you couldn't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's just, it, I, and it's, and, and particularly junior vet to junior vet, you see that a lot is fear of negligence, and they they wind each other up, and they, and it's just not the case. It's so expensive to sue somebody for negligence and take such a long time that really, yeah. Yeah. you know, what are you worried about? Interesting. So what are you worried about? Is that your take-home message on this then? Yeah, it could be. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. Well, I'd say, what are you worried about? What's the real worry? What is the real worry here? And fear is the thing. Yeah, I mean, over my career, I've done various things that, that to sort of, you know, I've tried something new. I've tried, you know, changing the way we monitor Cushing's disease or treat Cushing's disease. I, I, you've got to try something new. What are you worried about? Why not try something new? Yeah. yeah. I think there's a lot of fear out there and it doesn't need to be there. We need to be investigative still. We need to be eager, hungry to learn, don't we? rather than just set in our own ways. And accept that what you think is known is probably not. Yeah. yeah. From my other hand, I'll just say, get ethical approval before you start now, folks. Don't. <laughs> 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 the, yeah, it's important to get your always. I mean, you know, the first dog I treated with Veteral, I made sure I had three or four clinicians behind me to do it. Yeah, you know, there's no way you just go and do that for the first time without people around, you know, who, who've agreed with what you're doing. Well, well ev everything's giving you an injection of honey. I'm sorry, I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I think it's it's been fabulous chatting with you, and really appreciated your time this evening. And it beholds me to say that I'm hoping that you've enjoyed listening to Ian as well. And if you have, please click like, please click share and subscribe. It really does make a difference. So on whatever platform you're watching or listening to us, please click that subscribe button. It really makes a difference. Professor Ian Aramsey, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us this evening. I'll raise a glass to you while my coffee cup and say, may your dog go with you. May you talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much it's been an it's been an experience. <laughs> Cheers.